This is a traditional Ethiopian hide shield with a pretty distinctive shape and construction. Uh, from now on, whenever you see one of these, you'll be able to easily recognize them and say, oh, okay, I know where that comes from. It almost looks like a giant turtle shell. Now, it's Ethiopian, as I mentioned, but it gets a little bit more complicated than that. Um, most people say this kind of shield originated with the Arusi, A-R-U-S-I or A-R-U-S-S-I. And they are from southern Ethiopia, but you're not going to find a lot of information uh, at all about them. You'll find a bunch more about the Oromo, O-R-O-M-O, -O, and as you can see here, this area of land can be referred to as Oromia. And yes, you better believe I have no idea how to correctly pronounce these terms. But anyway, Oromo is a language, an Afro-Asiatic language, and the Oromo people are the largest ethno-linguistic group in Ethiopia. They're a pastoral people that migrated in, oh, about 400 years ago and took over a lot of area, a lot of land, and assimilated with the cultures that they conquered. And so the exact kind of shield we're looking at today is probably something that they adopted as a result of that process. Let's get a closer look now, a sturdy piece of work. And these were made from cow, hippopotamus, or buffalo hide. It's concave in shape, it's got a large central boss, as you can see there. And it's roughly two feet in diameter, and that seems to be the norm, something along those lines. And that's very different from the strategy employed with, like, this kind of shield, right? A lot of uh, ethnographic shields are large, and that makes sense. You want to cover as much of yourself as you can. Same thing with the classic Zulu cowhide shield, some of what you're seeing here. It's hard to tell in these pictures. I couldn't find any good pictures of these online. Sorry for the blurriness. I was kind of plagued by that with uh, compiling today's video. Anyway, these were large. But back to our part of Africa, here's a Ethiopian shield, northern Ethiopia and thereabouts, that's very similar. It's not our configuration, but it's very similar in size, shape, and construction. And globally, if you're talking about a two-foot diameter round shield, you're probably talking about a cavalry shield. On horseback, you are not going to want to carry a shield that covers you from head to toe, right? Just not practical. Uh, here's one that's made out of elephant hide, by the way. And notice that all of the small shields we're looking at are um, concave. Well, that makes sense. Just like this one here, you want an incoming blow to glance off of the shield as much as possible. These are all center grip shields, by the way. So small, round, concave with a center grip. And it seems a popular technique with that kind of configuration was to punch into the oncoming blow. And that would encourage it to find an angle and glance off, like we talked about. And now back to our specific shield type. Here's a great example, high quality picture. Things just look really, really wicked. Like they were made out of the scale from a monster from a Godzilla movie. And that thick hide is going to be durable. It really does provide you with some protection. I think I've talked about in other uh, videos and there was wicker shields in China, Korea, Persia, Greece. It all depends on what you happen to value more. If it's speed and maneuverability, then a lighter material is preferable. I thought this was amusing, but also interesting. Uh, the video game Age of Empires makes use of Aroma Warriors as gunpowder cavalry. And this picture is very low res, but it's the closest I could find to what I was looking for. Obviously, the African cavalry adopted firearms once they could. Now, once somebody is firing at you, the shield probably becomes a lot less useful, but you probably still had arrows, javelins, and melee combat to worry about. Notice our warrior here at the bottom center. He shows how you could still maintain your shield in kind of a ready position and operate your firearm. You'll notice in that illustration and this one that we see the small round shields used on horseback and on foot. I think maybe that was just more of a traditional thing. Like, hey, these are the kinds of shields we use here in this culture, so it doesn't matter how I'm fighting, it's what I'm going to have. Because I do think it doesn't make sense to not go bigger with the protection if you know you're going to be on foot. And part of the deal may be that the Oromo were almost always mounted. Uh, an 1888 Italian article, because Italian forces were in there fighting in Ethiopia, at the time called them the Cossacks of Africa. Quote, brought up among horses since infancy, they are better centaurs than the majority of Abyssinians. 
In the Oromo country, it is held as a disreputable thing to go about afoot instead of on horseback, end quote. Let's get back to our item. Here with the profile, you can really see that concave shape that I was talking about. It's easy to imagine with this view an incoming blow getting a shed off of the shield. Now, when you look at the center of the boss, it's not what you might expect. It's not really circular. It's got that kind of central spine. See that on the right? It's almost like a clamshell shape. And while we're here, we might as well get a really up-close view of that hide. It looks pretty awesome. One thing I haven't mentioned yet about these shields is in collecting circles, they became famous, uh, unfortunately, due to the famine, the famous famine in Ethiopia. Here's a view of the ridge, kind of the interior hoop that runs along the perimeter. But yeah, due to the agricultural and economic troubles in the 20th century, uh, these started to be exported. You might have noticed the bumps, the protuberances that our shield has throughout. Here's a couple of examples. Here's the first one that make a much bigger deal out of that kind of a thing. And those would obviously not be an offensive thing, uh, I wouldn't think. Uh, kind of reminds me of studded leather. It's a strengthening device. Uh, very much like the skin on a warthog or a crocodile. Which is exactly what they look like on our shield. Look over there on the upper right. There's a minor little construction detail, and we'll move on to the other side with just this one picture. But yeah, like I said, a central grip. A shield like this you hold at the end of your punch, basically, and that reminds us of that punch-through technique that we talked about. When you've got an incoming attack from the enemy. Sticking to battle considerations, one thing a shield like this would not be good for is punching your opponent. I mean, you would do it if you had to, but a lot of times a shield with a center boss, you'd specifically use it that way. Like this one here, which is a modern recreation, by the way. And this is going to have an effect when you pop somebody with that. With ours, hitting them with a punch would, I think at best, kind of discombobulate them. Maybe, you know, disrupt their balance. And an edge strike, which with some shields is absolutely devastating, uh, likewise wouldn't be much of a factor. With something like this. Well, one final little construction detail for you, and that is it. Hope you found this interesting. It's a very cool piece of ethnographic armor. A very distinctive and awesome-looking shield type. Thanks.